Hi, I'm Julie, and welcome to my video lecture on Romanesque fashion. I'll be honest, I'm being a little bit generous with this term here because uh, when we're speaking about Romanesque architecture, we're referring to a period from about 1000 CE to 1150 CE, and I'm stretching the margins of that era back to the fall of Rome and a little bit forward in focusing on European early medieval fashion. So you remember from our last unit, much of Western Europe was considered part of the Roman Empire for decades, if not centuries. And when the Roman Empire collapsed, there were still lots of Romanized people in Europe. And for those people, the Roman style of dress persisted and then got mixed in with the styles of the Germanic and Slavic people who routinely invaded and settled among them. And this image is from a mosaic. It's a detail from a mosaic discovered very recently at the Villa Imperial de Casal, Piazza Armorina. This is located in Sicily and it's the early fourth century CE. It depicts a wealthy Romanized woman, her two sons, and two ladies maids and you can see um, there are there are lots of pieces of these garments that look very much like what we were looking at last time when we were looking at imperial rome but these lands that had once been ruled by rome were increasingly populated by peoples from eastern europe from what we would now call russia and from northwest asia which romans and greeks would have considered barbarians and these were often uh, formerly nomadic people that then settled down and started to farm. And they had a very different sense of style than our Roman and Greek friends. Most notable is that the barbarians wore pants. And when they moved into these Roman territories, they brought this you know, kind of distinctly un-Roman garment with them. I'm showing you this image here, which is of a pair of the oldest known pants discovered in they're from a Yanghai graveyard, which is in China's Tarim Basin. These pants are about 3,000 to 3,500 years old. Um, the Tarim Basin is in Northwest China. These pants were made of wool, they're straight legged and they have a wide crotch. And so we think that trousers were invented to allow greater comfort when one is astride a horse, which was an activity that the people in the Tyrum Basin about 3,500 years ago would have done regularly. And what I love about these pants is that they're fairly simply constructed, right? They're two tubes of fabric to make the legs with a third uh, kind of shaped rectangle piece to make the gusset. But you can see there's been care to decorate them. There's different fabrics on different parts and um, they seem to have been rather lovingly repaired before they ended up in a bog or um, the graveyard. Here's another pair of very old pants. These are called the Thorsberg pants from about the fourth century CE. So right around the fall of Rome, these were discovered in Germany near Thorsberg. Um, and you can see that they're quite similar to the uh, Yanghai pants. These pants are footed and they have belt loops, but otherwise they're very similarly constructed. So these people that were coming from Northwest Asia and Eastern Europe brought their distinct garment with them. Here are construction patterns for both pairs of pants. So you can see how that center gusset allows for great ease of movement, even though the leg of the pant is relatively narrow. Because remember, we are thousands of years before uh, stretch fabrics and spandex. These pants can be made without cutting if you just weave the pieces of your cloth to the desired length and width on your loom, and then you can just stitch them together at that join where the gusset is. Then you can either run a belt through those belt loops or you can run a drawstring through the top fold over that top edge to make a little tunnel and then run a rope through it. And now you've got a drawstring to tighten those pants to fit. But these years after the kind of withdrawal of Rome from Western and Northern Europe, the collapse of that empire, we had much diminished trade, 
we had um, you know, loss of technology and know-how, we had greater sense of isolation. And so people relied on local materials and manufacture for lots of things, including their clothing. And the need for warmth took precedence over style. Of course, this you know, area of the world is much chillier and wetter than where Rome and where Athens and of course where Cairo are. So furs, leathers, and wool, both felted and woven, and then linen, were the common materials for the early medieval period. And gradually, a more cohesive sense of fashion emerged. You can see this emerging silhouette here in this detail from the Newminster Charter, uh, which is from about 966 CE. This is in England. The man in the center is King Edgar, and he is receiving the charter, which is a set of laws from the heavens. And on his left, you have the Virgin Mary. And on his right, you have St. Peter looking on. But these three figures, a man, a woman, and a man who is part of the clergy, are showing us this emerging style. Um, it's based on that late Roman style with accommodations for these chillier climates local materials, and influence from the barbarian horsemen. And the key to this is essentially people dressed in layers. And the tunic remains the basic garment of the era for both sexes, for all classes, and for almost all occupations. Now, it's important to remember that since these areas that were once ruled by Rome were splintering off into their own separate, not quite formed entities, language is evolving and Latin is no longer universally spoken, um, except amongst the very highest educated, which was most often the uh, Christian clergy. So as these new languages are developing, terms get a little squishy. So I've included this little guide here because the basic linen T-shaped tunic that is worn next to the skin is a is a pretty much a universal garment, but depending on where you are, you're going to call it different things. It could be a chemise, a cirque, a smock, a chens, um, or a, a, a shift, um, but that's basically what eventually is going to evolve into the shirt. And then you have this term coat or cut, which is an under tunic worn over the chemise. There are other words for this too in other languages, but this is the most common one that I'll refer to in this lecture. Over that, you have something called a surcoat or surcoat, an over tunic. That's going to be usually shorter than the other layers, and it's usually going to be a finer material, but it's not yet considered outerwear. It's it's over your underwear, okay? Um, alongside that coat or cut, that kind of middle layer, you might call it a kirtle, especially if you lived in the British Isles. That's a long tunic that's worn over the chemise. It was originally unisex, um, but it becomes a, a women-only garment over time. Um, and if you were clergy, lots of times your, your layer would be called an alb, and that just refers to the white tunic worn under the rest of the ceremonial garments. And this comes directly from that Roman term tunica alba. And then you might call something a robe or a gown, um, which could be worn by both men and women. It's not just a feminine garment. But that's going to be a long, loose, flowing outer garment worn by both sexes. So you can see it'd be confusing. So I'm going to try to stay consistent with my verbiage, but refer back to this chart if you need to. So here's an example of that linen tunic that is the underlayer for both sexes. I'm going to go with the term chemise here. Couple key differences, right? Usually for men, it's going to be about hip length or knee length. Why? Well, to accommodate those pants. For women who don't wear those trousers, the tunic is going to be ankle length. The chemise will be ankle length. Linen is going to be most common for men or women. I suppose they could have been made of wool too, but linen grew in various parts of Europe where there were rivers. You could have linen, you know, Ireland had linen, France had linen, um, et cetera, et cetera. And linen is going to be more comfortable against the skin than wool and easier to clean. You can see both um, chemises have long sleeves. Um, the style that's most popular is this round neck with a little slit front opening so that you can get it on and off over your head. So let's take a closer look at that Romanesque man's silhouette. You can't see his chemise or his shirt. It's underneath all these layers and fully covered up by them. But I'm going to trust that it is under there. You can see the pants 
Um, another term for pants in this era is going to be breeches or hosen, which becomes hose, right, um, on the bottom. So the chemise is tucked into those hose. Over that, this red layer is um, the tunic or the surcoat. And that's going to be worn over. It's looser. It's going to be knee length, long sleeved. Again, it's that T-shaped garment, but kind of cut a little bit bigger and roomier than the chemise. And you can see it's belted at the waist. And then over that, you've got a cloak. Oftentimes, if it's chilly, it's going to be fur lined to give you extra warmth. The length and the shape of that cloak is going to vary. And then on his feet, leather shoes. I'm going to be showing you lots of images of contemporary people wearing reproduction garments. I tried very carefully to get reliable sources for these repros. These are people who work with museums, um, not just people who are like going to hang out at a Renaissance fair or Halloween costumes. But these are people's best guesses based on studying existing garments and primary source material very carefully. Okay, so here is our Romanesque woman, and you can see she's got several layers. You can see the woman on the right is a little bit more clearly. You can see that that chemise um, is probably still covered, but then she's got that tunic or kirtle that's peeking out at the bottom, um, and then over that she's got her surcoat. The, the kirtle is, again, a little bit um, roomier than the chemise, um, but it's going to be kind of tight fitting compared to this third layer, the surcoat, which, which is much more roomy. And again, you can see that it's belted at the waist. Our lady reproduction on the right has um, a woven fabric girdle, which is uh, a woman's belt, but this could also be made of leather or of metal. Over all of this, she's got a cloak or a mantle. You can see that her cloak tends to be long. Men could have long or short cloaks as well. And then she's covered her hair with another piece of cloth, um, usually linen, and this is called a veil. And you can see um, on the right-hand side, it's held in place by a piece of leather or a piece of metal or a cord, which we would call a fillet. And that just keeps your veil on your head. And on her feet, she is also wearing leather shoes. And here's a typical Romanesque clergyman. Again, similar to men's secular wear, those same three layers. Over time, clergy start to develop a distinct style. As I said, um, the alb is this white tunic that is usually floor length that tends to be a flowing lobe with wide sleeves. So this is not the same as that chemise. It's gonna go over their chemise. This is gonna be a wide sleeved long, loose and flowing tunic, again, belted at the waist. And again, it's gonna be white. Over this, they might wear something called a chasuble. You can see this clearly on the right. It's a shaped um, circular garment with a hole for the head. Um, it might come down to the elbows. It might come down to the wrists. It, it might be with the head hole in the center of the garment. So it's kind of a perfect circular oval, or it might be a little bit off center like it is here so that it's longer in the back and shorter in the front. This is a ceremonial garment. It's gonna be highly decorated, particularly if you're a clergyman in a church with money. Uh, you can see our priest here on the right-hand side is also holding a, a thin rectangle with looks like fringe or decoration on the ends. That's called a stole. So that would be around their neck. Again, often highly decorated. And that is just kind of a, a symbol of priestly office. Another symbol that um, someone is a member of the clergy is their hairstyle. You can see them both here. The head, the top of the head has been shaved, leaving a fringe of hair around, but the crown of the head is bare. Um, this is called a tonsure or tonsure. There's other styles of doing this too. Different places shave the heads in different way, but they have this distinct hairstyle that says, I'm a member of the clergy. So let's take a little closer look at some tunics. This is um, a great example of a tunic that was made probably around 1100 CE. It's called the Kragelund tunic. 
uh, it was found, again found in a bog. Somebody fell in and it was preserved. So you can see the tapered sleeves. So it's wide at the armpit and narrower at the wrist. Um, it's fairly close to the body through the torso and then fairly wide skirted. Seems to come to about the knee. And you can see the neckline has a kind of deep V front and back opening to allow the head through that narrow space. But this tunic is built a little bit differently than that Roman tunica. And so here's an example. This is a bit more tailored. You can see we've taken that basic rectangle, but we've added triangle pieces um, to widen those skirts. So you add triangles from the waist down to the knee or the hip, and now you've got more um, circumference at the bottom while it's still narrow at the top. And you can take those same triangle shapes and make your sleeves so that they're wider at the armpit so you can move your sleeve around and narrow at the wrist so you don't drag your sleeve through your dinner. These triangles are called gussets and gores, and they're this kind of first attempt at tailoring to manipulate the shape of the garment on the body instead of just draping the body in fabric. And here's how one might cut a length of cloth to make a woman's kirtle, that tight fitting um, medium layer. So you can see we've um, played with the shape instead of just a basic rectangle, we're kind of more based on triangles. And you can see they've taken that rectangle of cloth and by kind of cleverly cutting some triangles and some trapezoids in there, we get that same um, fitted and flared look. And you can see how those triangles get turned around and then sewn onto the sides to create that wider skirt. And then those trapezoidy shapes get added onto the sleeve so you can have a long sleeve that's narrow at the wrist but wide enough at the armpit. And so here you can see there's some variations on styles and decorations. Some are going to be longer, some are going to be shorter. Neckline might vary a little bit. Decoration on it might vary a little bit. Notice the shaping at the hems of these two surcoats on the right. They're, they're shaped kind of scalloped in the green one and pointy triangles on the red one. Another innovation here is that the tunic or the surcoat might have a slit up the center front and center back from the hem to the waist. And this allows for better ease of movement if you're, you know, obviously makes it easier to ride a horse, uh, makes it easier to run or to farm or to swing a sword. And you can see here on the left, um, these are men from their soldiers. They're a detail from the Bayou Tapestry, which is um, an embroidered piece of linen that tells the story of William, the conqueror of Normandy, taking over England in 1066 CE. And on the right, we have a modern reconstruction of what that might look like. And so just one more thing about textiles, right? Um, most people are going to be using linen and wool because that's local. But this doesn't mean that trade stopped altogether. It just became more arduous and more difficult and less reliable and therefore much more expensive. But the highest ranking people and the wealthiest people still had access to luxury imported goods. And so they had things like silk and they could afford to have gold and gems. So on the left here, this is a painting um, that is of a Frankish queen. Her name was uh, Arnegund, and she was a queen in the mid 500 CE. And they discovered her grave um, and found fragments of textiles and they found her jewelry. And this is their best reconstruction of what she looked like. But her garments, um, she had a violet colored silk um, kirtle and um, had a leather belt that was had this beautifully decorated um, gold buckle. And then she had um, a reddish brown silk over tunic that was decorated with gold braid. And she had these um, beautiful fibulae with it. And she had um, a red silk veil. Our lady on the right is a contemporary reenactor and she's dressed in linen and wool. So same shape, different materials. And one way that people of both sexes and of all classes could kind of get some more variety into their outfits is by embellishing. Most often the fabrics are going to be plain, solid colors. Those are the easiest to weave. 
And the embellishment is going to be embroidery around the neckline, around the hems, and sometimes down that center front seam. And you could use linen or wool thread, or if you were wealthy and well-connected, you could have silk thread. Um, these embroideries could often be woven on separate bands that were then attached to the garments um, and sometimes woven on the garments themselves. But you could see that this is the embroidery, the embellishment is the most labor intensive part of the garment. Um, and if you have them woven on those separate bands, then you can very easily remove them and put them on a different garment um, if that base garment wears out. So here you can see um, what some of that embellishment might look like if you were a one percenter. This is a silk coronation tunic for Roger II of Sicily around 1134. I've seen this garment. It's now in, I think, the Hofburg Museum in Vienna, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It looks it looks brand new because um, he probably only wore it once and then it got put away for posterity. But you can see the embroidery here is with metallic gold thread on silk with little pearls in there, um, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And even though these materials would have been outrageously expensive and beyond the reach for, you know, the average person, by having these highly decorated kind of accent pieces on their garment, you're still going to be spending less money than embroidering the whole thing. And it makes a really lovely contrast. And here are modern reproductions of embroidery using um, Nordic and Celtic um, and Frankish designs and Saxon designs that would have you know, been developing in these different areas at the time. These seem to be have done with linen um, and wool threads. Um, some of these colors seem a little bright, but but these are people's uh, recreations of what what people in that time might have done. So if you think back to that slide two slides ago, our, our king of Sicily, right? It's still the same basic shape as these peasants who are here laboring in the fields. It's a very practical shaped garment. Um, and you can see same shape, just rougher fabrics and less decoration. Now for men underneath all of this, they would have underpants and the term most commonly used for them at this time is called braise. Um, we're referring to these loose linen pants that are worn right next to the skin. Um, I don't think you would tuck your shirt into these. I think you would tuck your shirt into the pants that go over it, but, uh, you know, I wasn't around back then, so I'm not quite sure. They could be long or they could be knee length. You can see that these um, probably go down to the ankle, but they've been turned up and knotted and tied into this rolled waistband to um, hike them up to the knee. Here's a modern reproduction. You can see that rolled down waistband. It rolls down over the belt and then the bottom edge is drawn up with a cord to um, make them short and some patterns for how you might make them. So very early boxer shorts. Now, us with our very, very form-fitting undergarments might be like, oh my God, these braids look ridiculous. And how would you get pants into them? Well, this is how medieval men wore pants. These are called hose or hosen in Germany or shows in French. Um, and as you can see, they're not quite pants. <laughs> they're really like really long stockings. So, and again, this is before spandex, right? So this is a woven garment that covers the legs. And then you can see they're tied onto these braids in the middle and the, the center piece is open. And these hose are typically going to be wool. Um, they may stop at the ankle or they may enclose the whole foot like socks like these do. But these are tending to be wool and not linen. Both men and women would wear stockings. Um, Women weren't wearing those hose that go all the way up to the waist. They tended to wear stockings and went up to the knee and they would be held in place with a garter. So a belt around just under your kneecap, top of your calf, holding that stocking up. And even though we didn't have stretchy fabrics back then, um, people did figure out how to get a little stretch and a little bodycon uh, shaping into hose. So here's this pattern for how to make stockings or hose, by turning the fabric on the diagonal and cutting things on the diagonal, this is called bias. And if you take your fabric on the diagonal, you 
get some stretch out of it. And that allows it to curve around the curvy part of the leg. It allows it to get a little bit bigger um, at the calf and still stay pretty narrow at the ankle. Let's talk a little bit about outerwear, right? Cloaks, rectangular or circular, are still pretty much the way it goes. You can see these are a bit longer to the knee or a little bit below. Um, they can be um, held in place with a brooch um, or they could tie, um, but brooches are pretty popular because that allows you to wear the cloak um, several different ways, right? You can pin it at the center like the men here on the right, or you could pin it over one shoulder to free your arm, which is handy if you've got a sword. And you could get quite a bit of volume out of these cloaks. Now you can cut a circular cloak, um, kind of like our guy here on the right from the Bayou Tapestry, um, and see how they take a rectangle of fabric, cut it into triangles, sew those triangles together so the pointy ends are all at the neck and the bottoms are all at the hemline, and now you've got a circle or a half circle and you haven't wasted any fabric. Or you could cut your cape as a rectangle, right? Like this tabard cape here on the left, right? Um, one long rectangle and cut the um, oval out for your head to go through. And then what you could do is take that oval of fabric, cut it in half, stitch it on over the shoulders, and now you've got two little baby sleeves. Here are some examples of women's cloaks. Another word that we might use to call a cloak, particularly when talking about women, is a mantle. Um, and just like our uh, Greek and Roman women with their hamashians and their um, stola, you could wear it around your shoulders or you could pull it up over your head as well. So I've got some ladies um, in the middle from the period. And then I have some modern reproductions on either side showing you some of that variety. Um, and you can see, again, the materials that you lose are going to define your status. Wool is going to be pretty much what you want for these if you're going to be out in all weather. If you were wealthy, you... Um, could line the inside with fur, and then you've got this wonderfully warm um, kind of insulating layer. I suppose you could make it out of silk if you had access to that. Um, and then again, you can see here on these women in the middle um, from the Stuttgart Schalter, they've got decorated edges, and then um, the cloak clasp can be as fancy or as plain as you can make it. One thing that's a little bit interesting to me is that the two of the three women here in the Stuttgart Sarlto, they, they have pinned their cloaks in the middle at their necks um, with a single pin. But our ladies, our reenactors, they kind of have the cloak um, a little bit more open, exposing their um, surcoat so you can see more of their outfit. And they, so that means they've got kind of two pins and a cord connecting it together. Or again, you can have a closed mantle, so an oval or a rectangle cloak with a hole that you cut out um, off center for the head, like our Virgin Mary here. And you can see her cloak um, seems to have some sort of uh, tapestry design woven into it, which tells us something about her status, um, as most of the things that we have seen have been quite plain except for that border decoration. Another little piece of outerwear that you might find um, are these things called winnegas. Um, you saw them back in Rome. Um, we called them putties then. Um, I think this is the German word winnegas. Um, but you can see it's a, it's a long, narrow strip of cloth, probably wool, and um, it wraps around the leg from, you know, instep around the ankle all the way up to the knee. And then they've got a pin that, that holds it in place at the end. And so you can tuck your pants into that um, and have you know an extra layer of warmth or um, kind of a, a weatherproof layer if you're slogging through mud. Here are some early medieval shoes. You can see a lot of them tend to be low cut. A lot of them remind me of moccasins. Um, they're gonna be held together with rope um, or cord or hemp twine. Um, or more leather thongs. Sometimes they can be decorated. Um, and then you also have this low um, leather ankle boot. We have a tendency when we make um, period costume dramas set all the way back in medieval times to have everybody clomping around wearing boots. But the expense of that leather to cover your calf um, is going to be out of reach of most people. It's, you know, obviously less expensive to buy a shoe that just covers um, you to the ankle. 
And I think leather all the way up to your knee is going to be a bit uncomfortable um, unless you've got some really good layers to keep you from forming blisters. So boots tended to be for soldiers, um, for people who were out hunting and horseback riding. Um, but if you are a city dweller or um, doing indoor activities, it's going to be shoes. And you can see it here in this image, which is from the Stuttgart Assaulter. Um, you've got men and women. The men are obviously soldiers. The women are not soldiers. <laughs> the soldiers are wearing knee-length boots with those very long toes, and the women are wearing shoes. Wanted to talk to you a little bit about jewelry. So here are the pieces that were found in the tomb of that Frankish queen, um, again, from around 550 CE. So you can see her belt buckle, right? The leather belt has, has decayed, but the gold and bronze belt buckle is still there, and it's, you know, beautifully... Um, kind of filigreed and carved, and she's got some gemstones set in it. Um, she's got a pair of brooches and this long pin that I think was for her hair, and then some smaller pins that were holding her veil in place. Her brooches have gold and some gemstones in them. She was wearing gold earrings with a gemstone, and she had a signet ring. Here's some more jewelry, again, gold and bronze with some enamel and... Um, um, cloisonne worked in there. But note how um, we're dealing with some very kind of like abstract geometric shapes here, this kind of knot work, you know, which um, the Irish Celts did, the Scots did, the Nordic people in Norway and Sweden and down into Denmark um, and um, the Netherlands. Um, these are all kind of coming out of that um, Eastern European Slavic Russia area and get kind of translated um, and evolved in these different um, places where they end up. Here's some more Viking jewelry. Again, you can see this was a, a silver bracelet with wolf heads, um, but again, very abstract and geometrical. Some brooches that could have held a cloak in place um, designed to look like the back of a tortoise. And then we have glass and bone beads to make a necklace. Here's a really, I think it's a really beautiful crown from about 1000 CE. It's a coronet, and you can see we've got those fleur de lis. Those are, um, you know, three leaf lily, which ends up becoming the symbol of French royalty. Um, but this was supposedly the crown um, that Otto III was crowned with when he became Holy Roman Emperor. We're not quite sure that that's true anymore, but um, certainly seems worthy of a coronation. If you're not a king or an emperor and you still need to cover your head, um, here's a much more affordable option. These hoods, you can see that they are um, not just a hat, but they cover the neck and shoulders, um, sometimes as far down to the elbow. Um, and the, the part that covers the actual head tends to be pointed in the back. That's not the only kind of headgear that medieval men wore. You can see um, the the coif, which would be a very close fitting linen head covering that's just covering, you know, the, the crown and the back of the head and then would tie under the chin. Um, that Phrygian cap, which was, you know, popular in ancient Greece to uh, denote someone who is a barbarian that carries over and he seems to have a lion or a wolf um, embroidered or brocaded onto that. Um, or you can have a, a you know, a wide brim kind of high crown straw or felt hat, which is a great um, sunshade. Women in this era tended to cover their hair. So a little bit different from our Egyptian women who wore wigs, our Greek women who had, you know, um, in the archaic period had the long hair um, kind of free and then um, Greek matrons in the Hellenic period who would knot their hair into a bun and then kind of cover it with a scarf, but you could still see lots of their hair. Women in medieval Europe tended to cover their whole head and not expose a lot of their hair in, in this Romanesque period. So we've got veils, we've got cover chiefs, and as you can see, um, it's covering the top of the head, the back of the head, the ears, the neck, and partially the shoulders. So your, your head is peeking out. These tended to be made of linen, makes sense if it's covering your hair, it's kind of against your hair and your skin, so it's easy to wash if it gets soiled or sweaty. Um, they could be very fine, 
Um, they could be almost see-through, um, or they could be, you know, thicker and, and more practical. And lastly, I wanted to talk very briefly about armor. Here's another detail from the Bayou Tapestry. And these kind of circle blobs that are covering these men here from shoulder to knee, this is their armor, and it's made of chain mail. So it's rings of metal that are kind of linked together to make a mesh tunic. So obviously this is going to be heavy, it's going to be hot, um, but lots of little rings are going to hopefully stop blades um, from cutting into the skin, so it's going to protect you. Um, underneath this chainmail, they might have leather um, to allow even more protection, um, and then they're going to sometimes have a padded kind of quilted garment underneath that to protect their own body from pinching and from heat and from rubbing. And here are some examples of that chain mail. Um, you can see um, the, the head covering here in our man in the center, it's called a helm um, and the entire face is covered. This would just be for a high ranking, you know, knight. Um, down there on the bottom left is a, typically a Norman helmet, which just is a dome that covers the top of the head. And then they have that like triangle nose guard. On the top left here, you have a Saxon helmet that just looks like half of a beach ball covering the head out of metal. And they would wear a padded cap underneath it so that the metal wasn't touching their head. And then that on the right hand side there, a metal, um, a male chain mail shirt is called a hauberk. But you can see it's still the basic same shape as that tunic, but now it's made out of metal mesh.